Hello everyone, welcome to another series of the Mind the Bleep Careers. Um, today we're going to be having a little look at paediatrics with ST1 Anna Jackson. Um, remember to just put any questions that you have in the chat and there's an opportunity um, to get a certificate at the end um, with a feedback form and we'll put the link towards the end on the chat. Um, are you ready to go Anna? Yes I am, yeah I'll just share my screen now. Okay, just so I can get before I get started, can I check that everyone can see the big slide there? Yeah, that's all good. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so my name's Anna. I'm one of the um, paediatric SD ones, and I'm currently training in the Northern Deanery. Um, and that just means that I'm in the first year of my paediatric specialty training. Um, so I'm going to start by talking a bit about paediatrics today, but I'll start by introducing myself. Um, so this is me when I kind of started thinking about doing paediatrics. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at um, Newcastle Medical School, um, where I got perfect in where I got in, uh, kind of interested in paediatrics in my first year. Um, I remember one of the very first lectures I went to that was like clinical lecture. One of the um, neonatologists was teaching us a bit about the life cycle and he brought a newborn baby into the lecture theatre um, in a cot um, and kind of examined it in front of us all. And that's what made me initially interested in paediatrics. Um, I kind of got a bit of exposure during medical school, um, but I appreciate that is quite hard to do, um, which is something I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. Um, so I applied to do my foundation programme at one of the district general hospitals in the northeast, which is based in Sunderland, and actually got a paediatric rotation as part of my F2 year, which is the second year of your foundation training. I really enjoyed that placement, but I wanted a bit more experience. Um, so I applied for a year as a paediatric teaching fellow. Um, and that was working for Newcastle University and Newcastle Hospitals. And I spent half my time teaching medical students, mainly about child health, and the other half of my time kind of working clinically. And I realised that that was definitely what I wanted to do. So I applied for paediatric specialty training in the Northern Deanery and started in September. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, but now we'll move on to talk a bit more about paediatrics in general. So I've just got a clip here. Um, and people might have seen this. This is from Geordie Hospital, um, which was on Channel 4 recently. Um, I've just got this short clip to show you a bit about why I like paediatrics. Um, this is actually a patient I looked after and I was actually working on the ward when they filmed this. So I've just got a really short clip just to show you. Okay, um, I'll put the link in for that clip um, afterwards because I think it's not you um, particularly clearly. Um, but that was just a clip of a little boy that I looked after called Kit, who you might have been able to see in the video. He was a four year old boy who um, developed cardiomyopathy um, and was put onto a machine called a ventricular assist device. Um, and that means that they live basically on the ward and um, waiting for a transplant. Um, it was in the first episode of um, Geordie Hospital, if anyone's interested and would like to watch it. Um, the reason why I picked this clip is just to show you a bit about what paediatrics can be like. Um, and Kit was a real model patient because he was always cheerful, always ready to play and so resilient. And whatever you threw at him, he would overcome it. So I'll put the link in for that at the end. 
Um, so what is paediatrics? Um, so I think I probably didn't fully understand this until I started working into the specialist team myself. Um, but actually, paediatrics cover all the way from conception to 16 years and actually beyond. So a lot of our paediatric specialty consultants work in fetal medicine, so particularly the cardiology consultants and the renal consultants, where they go and meet families um, when they're still pregnant with a child and explain to them a bit about what's going to happen when that child is born. Um, we go all the way through childhood, all the way up to the age of 16, and actually quite a lot of the time beyond that, um, we keep a lot of our children with complex needs up until the age of 18. And there's actually a move towards keeping um, type 1 diabetic patients up until the age of 25. And that's because actually type 1 diabetes, the worst control is age 19 to 25. Um, and that's because they kind of go into uni or get in their own houses and therefore the control of diabetes deteriorates. And it's felt that actually in paediatrics, we might manage that slightly better. The other thing um, is to know is that it's run through training. So what that means is that you apply um, at the start of ST1 and it's run through for eight years up until you become a consultant. Um, so it's not like other specialties where there's a split between core and then you apply to be a registrar. You just apply, you get the job and you go all the way through. And then finally, a bit about what you can do as a paediatric consultant. Um, so consult, paediatric consultants are based in lots of different places, um, but they tend to be placed in either a tertiary centre, which is a big children's hospital, and usually in one of the main cities in the UK, um, or in a district general hospital, um, where they might do slightly different jobs. Um, some paediatricians as well are based in the community, um, or at various genetic labs and things like that. Um, when you become a consultant, there's two main options. So you can become a general paediatrician where you look after um, children a bit more generally, um, or you can be a subspecialist with a special interest in a certain area. I think this is slightly different to the way it's done in kind of adult medicine, where a lot of uh, most of the consultants will have a special interest, but might cover general medicine as part of their role. In terms of choosing to specialise, there's two different options, um, which I will talk a bit more about later on. So the first option is something called GRID, which is where you actually become a subspecialist in the area. Um, so at the end of your general paediatric training, you decide, no, I want to subspecialise in a specific topic, and you will become a consultant in that specific topic. I've just kind of got a bit of a picture here to look at the broad range of topics that you can cover, because I think that's one of the real advantages of paediatrics is how broad it is. So you can go from being a community paediatrician um, or potentially being um, working on a paediatric intensive care unit. And that can all be done from paediatrics as a main stem. I'll just leave that slide up for a little moment just so you can have a little read through. Certainly specialties that I wasn't really aware of um, before was things like metabolic medicine, which is a big part of paediatrics. Don't tend to have that as much in adults um, because we diagnose and manage a lot of metabolic conditions when, they're, when children are younger. Um, and also you can work in child mental health from paediatrics as well. So it might be that you wanted to subspecialise and in which case you would do something called GRID, which we've just talked about. Or some people decide that actually, no, I still want to be a general paediatrician. I still want to work with children um, on the wards or in clinics with kind of general paediatric problems. But I do have a specific interest in this certain area. And these are all the potential options that you can do. Um, particular ones of note are things like safeguarding. So you might become a named doctor for safeguarding and work with the police on child protection medicals. Or you could um, have an interest in something like high dependency units, which where you work, work in a kind of DGH, um, but look after the more acutely unwell hospital, uh, acutely unwell patients in that hospital. A couple of our consultants have an interest in HDU and then in transfer medicine as well. So they work for our transfer service um, with the ambulances, transferring acutely unwell children from kind of around the region to the tertiary centres. Uh, the final one that I wanted to just highlight is um, young people's health. Um, so we've got a couple of um, consultants that have an interest in that in our hospital. Um, and that's adolescent health, so sort of the 12 to 16 year old group. And a lot of their stuff is working with kind of um, children that have chronic medical problems and adolescents. Um, but they also run things called young people's advisory groups, which is groups that get adolescent children involved in creating policies for the hospital and doing things like designing wards. And aside from your clinical work, there's loads of other things you can get involved in in paediatrics. And this is 
throughout your training, but also as a consultant. So leadership and management, education, which is what I did in my year between foundation and paediatric training, um, research, so there's a lot of academic options in paediatrics, quality improvements, so that's things like audits and patient safety. And then a lot of paediatricians work with public health, um, so working on things like they're trying to make the red book, which is the book that has all your vaccination records and growth charts. That's trying to be transitioned to be virtual. So a lot of trainees and consultants are working with um, the government on that. Or you might have an interest in health technology and sometimes paediatrics is a real leader for health technology particularly as I mentioned in like type 1 diabetes, a lot of our patients will have the blood implanted blood glucose monitors and insulin pumps, which aren't as available um, for adult patients. So that's a little bit about what paediatrics is, but why would you choose paediatrics? Um, I'll have this into the positives and the perceived challenges. So the real positives I think personally of working with paediatrics is being able to work with children. Um, and not just working with the children, but also with, also with their families. Um, and you do, because they have their families with them all the time, you end up with a real long-term relationship with them. Um, working with children always has its upsides and its benefits. Um, it's a real nice to break up your day by just going to kind of play or mess about um, in the middle of your on-call shift. Um, the other day I spent about half an hour reading a book to one of our patients because their mum had to pop out to go and get some stuff from home um, and that really made my on-call shift. As we've kind of covered in the previous slides, there's a real broad range of opportunities both clinically and outside of the clinical environment and I do think it's one of the kind of last remaining truly general specialties if you pursue to decide to be a general paediatrician. All kind of paediatric teams are really friendly and supportive and um, the consultants kind of go by their first name terms and they're always approachable and you're kind of never going to be shouted at for contacting or escalating to them. And then the bottom two things are something that you might not think about. Um, I personally really like the diagnostic challenge that you get in paediatrics. So a lot of children are presenting with genetic problems or metabolic problems or endocrine problems um, that when you work in adults, they'll already have that diagnosis. But we're kind of at the start of that process and making those um, diagnoses, which is really interesting. And kind of piecing together all different bits of the puzzle um, and deciding what tests to do um, is really rewarding. And I am going to cover this a bit more detail, but procedures um, procedures are a bit more difficult in paediatrics. Doing something on a tiny baby or a kind of non-cooperative toddler is a lot more difficult um, than in some other areas. Um, but as part of that, you get to work with the amazing people such as play specialists who are specially trained to kind of help children get through um, painful procedures or things like taking bloods. Um, and kind of working with a child and explaining to them what you're going to do and then making that as least traumatic as possible is really rewarding. So in terms of kind of perceived challenges, and I've put this because um, as part of my role um, as a teaching fellow, I did a research project looking at um, why what medical students felt the barriers were to paediatrics. And these are some of the themes that came up. So one of the top one which people always ask me about is involvement in safeguarding. Um, and I think people are worried that they'll find that particularly challenging. Um, safeguarding is definitely a big part of our role um, and it is involved in kind of all aspects of paediatrics. However, it's kind of my opinion that that's identifying safeguarding concerns and protecting the child and potentially supporting the family is probably the best um, thing you can do for that child in terms of their long term development and their long term outcomes. Emotionally challenging. So um, it can be particularly emotionally challenging, particularly if you've got children that unfortunately have um, kind of palliative conditions or um, potentially um, might even pass away. It does happen infrequently, um, but it does definitely happen. Um, what I would say to that is, um, yes, it is really challenging, but um, the team around you are really supportive and really aware of that. And it is relatively infrequent. A couple of things that came out that um, I was a bit surprised about were people were quite worried about the rota and that it was quite intense um, and the consultant job can be quite intense. I have to say that's not my experience. I don't think my rota is particularly worse compared to my other colleagues at a similar stage of training. 
and I, I think our consultants are kind of around as much as the um, other consultants that I've worked with in other specialties but that is my personal um, experience um, and you can choose to go down um, a route such as community paediatrics where you don't do as much on-call work. And finally this one's a little bit um, challenging and kind of related to the meme in the bottom corner but some people find like working with parents and carers difficult. I have to say I find it the converse true because it's so rewarding to ask go and take a history from someone and they know every single thing that's ever happened to them where which I found when I worked in adults was um, slightly different because um, it might be that they don't know what their medical problem is or what medications they take but usually parents and carers will know everything about that child um, and aside from obviously some cases of safeguarding you are usually on the same side and working together. So I thought I'd move on a little to talk a little bit about my training so far and kind of a typical day. And um, bearing in mind, I'm quite um, early on in my training. Um, so these are my rotations for my first two years um, in specialty training. Um, so this year I'm doing three four month posts um, all in various subspecialties. So I've just done four months in paediatric gastroenterology and nephrology, which was based in a tertiary centre. So I was working with children who are on parental nutrition, so nutrition through a vein, um, and children who had kid who were on dialysis or had kidney transplants. My current job, I've just gone back to the paediatric cardiology ward that you saw Kit on in that video at the beginning, and that's another tertiary centre, um, and we're one of the two transplant centres in the UK. Um, and then my final job is going to be in paediatric respiratory medicine um, and we work with kind of children with cystic fibrosis um, and children who are on long-term ventilation so have things like tracheostomies and things like that. And um, the reason why I've kind of written those um, specialties down is just to show like how varied paediatrics is but also um, because of the way paediatrics is set up where there's tertiary kind of children's hospitals in big cities um, it does mean that certain, every single region has like a different special interest. Um, so Newcastle, where I work, the cardiology centre is really big. Um, we have a very big bone marrow transplant unit. Um, but various other regions and various other hospitals around the country will have their own kind of special area. So, for example, Leeds um, has a special interest in liver and a lot of the paediatric patients that have liver problems go there. Um, and then in my second year um, is a bit more general. Um, so I'm going to do six months on the neonatal intensive care unit and then six months in general paediatrics at a district general hospital. And that will involve time in clinic. Um, so seeing children as outpatients and also some time in um, safeguarding as well. So I wanted to talk a bit about what a typical day is for a paediatrician, specifically a paediatric trainee. Um, and I actually found it really difficult because it is so variable. Um, so this is an example of um, when I worked in general paediatrics um, and a kind of typical day. Um, this is at 8.30 till 9 o'clock day, so it is a long day on on-call day. Um, most of your standard days are sort of 8.30 till 5. Um, so normally, um, and every paediatric department I've worked with is the same, um, you'd start your day with half an hour of teaching. Um, and that's end, the end of um, some people's night shifts, which can be a little bit difficult. Um, you then have a period of handover and following that you go on a ward round. Um, this is another kind of unique thing to paediatrics so it tends to be that you split off um, with consultants and registrars kind of split off and then you all come back together at lunchtime to discuss all the patients and you do a kind of ward board round and coffee and catch up and get the opinions of the consultants and the various patients. You then can usually get some lunch, lunch before you do your jobs from the ward round in the afternoon. In most paediatric places, you then do a kind of second ward round and they're classed called tea time reviews. So those patients that weren't quite well enough in the morning, but might be well enough to go home now are then seen again, or patients that you're concerned about that might be unwell. At the end of your standard day, you tend to hand over to the on-call team. And then a lot of your out of hours work or on-call work may even be based in the paediatric emergency department, which is slightly different to other areas where you work, where you're mainly ward based and then ending with a handover. And then I just wanted to show you a bit of other things you might end up doing during the day. So um, one thing I quite like is when a mum's like, oh, I just want to go to the bathroom, do you mind holding my baby? Absolutely. Um, always got time to cuddle a small baby. Um, we always have medical students around because they're all doing their child health blocks. Um, 
in lots of centres, um, the SHO, so the kind of my level of training, run the prolonged jaundice clinic. So that's babies that are, remain jaundice after sort of three weeks of life. It might be that you have a baby come in with a temperature um, and you have to do what's called a septic screen. Um, so that will include putting a cannula in a baby, um, taking a lumbar puncture and potentially either doing a suprapubic aspiration, which is where you take urine from just below the um, belly button or um, doing a catheter. Um, you might want to take time to speak to a teenager who's potentially being bullied and, and chooses to open up to you about that. And we have a special tool for talking to teenagers about potential social issues they might be having. There's also opportunities for audit and research, um, which you can get involved with. It might be that your consultant's doing a safeguarding medical, so you might want to go and see that. Or, as I mentioned earlier, you might want to go and read a book to a toddler just while their mum pops out to get some clothes or some food. And finally, something that I think um, is kind of unique to paediatrics, particularly if you work in a, um, a big hospital, um, you might be asked to attend a trauma call as the paediatric representative. Um, so I've been to like things like car accidents, um, major burns um, as the paediatric um, doctor, um, and you're there to kind of help with the prescribing of fluids, assessing the child um, and cannulating the child. So that's a little bit about what um, paediatrics is like and why I kind of would chose paediatrics. Um, but now we're going to talk a bit about the application and the interview. Um, just a caveat to that, um, I applied during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, so some things were slightly different. But I've tried to include a bit about what it was like before um, COVID and what it was like afterwards. So just some of the basic application um, kind of facts. Um, it's national recruitment and it's usually at level SD1, so that's the first year of paediatric training. However, there are a few fast track options. So, for example, um, there is an option to apply later on to become a registrar if you've got um, equivalent experience or if you've been working abroad. In 2020, there were 712 applicants in the UK for around 461 posts, um, with the majority of those being invited to interview. The data from last year, which is when I applied, isn't available yet, um, but there were a lot more applicants last year. But I think that was representative of all kind of specialty applications as a whole um, due to the COVID pandemic. So it's similar to other applying for other specialties. You apply in um, kind of November time, interviews are February and March, and then you get offers in April. One of the other kind of advantages is that you don't start until September, so you get a nice month off in August to enjoy yourself before you start your training. It does mean you're always slightly out of sync with your friends, but another kind of good thing about it is that you um, get all your summer leave at once, so you know what your summer leave is going to be until the end of August in advance, instead of changing at the start of August. So I think a lot of people worry that they need paediatric experience to apply for paediatrics. Um, the RCPCH, which is the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, are very clear that there is no requirement at all of prior paediatric experience. And that's because they recognise that this can be really challenging to get. What they're looking for is that you have an understanding of the specialty and are passionate about it and that you have an aptitude and a motivation to do the specialty. So you have those transferable skills um, that can be applied to paediatrics as a specialty and that you want to be a paediatrician. So um, instead of a kind of portfolio, they have an application form. And this is just some of the stuff they ask about. Um, what they want you to do basically is relate any experience you have to paediatrics if possible. Um, and they use this to decide who to interview. One thing that just to note is that in all the areas, they kind of scored them at between like three and five. And the top marks were for your ability to reflect. Um, so they really appreciate the uh, kind of skill of reflection um, in paediatrics. And that's reflected throughout the application process. So things that you can get points for are additional qualifications, which are things like um, I, like I had my postgraduate certificate in medical education or you can have a master's a degree um, but that's definitely not necessary. The other thing you can get points for is for doing the MRCPCH exams however that is definitely not essential and I don't actually know many people who had their exams before they applied. 
They then ask for transferable clinical skills and transferable clinical experience. And again, that definitely doesn't have to be in paediatrics. Um, they're just looking for um, kind of your skills that you have and how that could apply to the specialty. They then ask about kind of quality improvement and audit, any leadership and management roles you've had, any ed academic achievements, any involvement in teaching. And then finally, they just ask for a supporting statement where you explain why you want to do paediatrics. So as you can see, it's quite general and quite similar to lots of other specialties, but with no requirement if you're having any experience in that specialty. So if um, you're successfully shortlisted, you're then invited to interview. Um, and I've just split this into how it was pre-COVID and post-COVID. So post-COVID, it's been a virtual interview. I don't know how long what that will continue, but I imagine that the setup will be similar. And there's four stations. Um, so there's a communication station where they have a child or parent actor um, and you have to kind of discuss um, something difficult with them. So I think some examples of like a patient with asthma who's wanting to be self-discharge or I had a child who um, the nurses were concerned that they might have low mood um, and they wanted me to speak to them about potentially speaking to a mental health team. They then have a clinical reasoning station, which is kind of like an acute um, scenario of a child who's unwell, um, but they, uh, they don't expect you to operate at any level higher than a foundation doctor. And um, then they ask you about why you want to be a paediatrician and they ask you things like, why, do, why would you be suited to this career? Have you got any role models in this specialty? And then finally, they just ask you to reflect on um, an incident that you've been involved in um, and they give you the questions for that in advance. Um, and I think it just highlights again that how important they view reflection within the specialty. It was relatively similar um, pre-COVID, um, just that they had a slightly different station on prescribing um, and that was the main difference. The portfolio station was very similar to the career motivation station. So obviously experience isn't required, um, but there is ways to get experience if you want to see a paediatrics will see you. So I think just as a medical student, the first of all thing I would say is just to make the most of your paediatric placement. Um, when I ran the paediatric placements for our third and fifth years, they were quite flexible. And if you're interested, there was loads of opportunities for you to get more involved. Also, paediatrics is not the only specialty where you see children. I've got a list of the other specialties where you see children um, at the end of my slides, um, but just make the most of any placement that you have um, and take that opportunity to see children if you can. Most medical schools will have some student selected components or electives. Um, I did my elective in child health um, in Sri Lanka, and then I did do a, um, a student selected component in safeguarding. But again, I don't think that's essential at all. Most medical schools have lots of opportunities for volunteering with children, either separately or through student societies. So there's lots of things like Teddy Bear Hospital, where you go into schools and kind of um, educate children about like going to the doctors or there's just lots of societies where children can be taught CPR and things like that. There is a national UK Aspire and Paediatric Society which I would really recommend joining. Um, they have lots and lots of conferences and resources and talks um, and you can get a mentor through that as well. Um, as well as each individual medical school often has a paediatric society which may link up with the UK Aspiring Paediatric Society or be independent and they often have conferences and opportunities and mentors through that. And um, kind of second to last, the actual RCPCH website is amazing and as a medical student you become a member for free and they often have prizes and tickets for conferences um, and other things that you can get involved with. So I'd really recommend becoming a student member of the RCPCH. And finally, you can do audits and research products if you would like to, but again, that's definitely not essential. So moving on to gaining experience as a doctor, I kind of split this up as a foundation doctor and then post foundation. It's definitely never too late to develop an interest in paediatrics um, and they certainly look on years out um, of training quite favourably. Um, so they, they definitely don't mind you having more experience outside of foundation training. So as a foundation doctor, you can do paediatric rotations and they are useful, but there's not loads of them. Um, so they're certainly not essential. And as I've kind of said a few times, you can get loads of skills from other specialties and see children on other specialties. 
There is always the opportunity to do taster weeks and most paediatric um, hospitals will be more than happy to have you for a taster week. You can actually even apply um, from any uh, kind of deanery in the country to do a taster week at Great Ormond Street, for example. You can do audits and research projects again, but again, they're not essential. There's lots of conferences and career events that you can attend through the RCPCH or the UK Aspiring Paediatric Society. And you can actually also do some paediatric courses. So when I was um, doing a foundation doctor, I did the advanced paediatric life support course, which is the kind of paediatric equivalent of advanced life support. But there are other courses such as like um, newborn life support that you can do as well. And then after completing foundation training, there's loads of posts um, related to paediatrics um, out there that can help you get some more experience just if you want to see if this is for you. So there's stuff like what I did, which is a teaching fellow post. You can even be a clinical research fellow. Um, one of my friends is working in Liverpool um, as a clinical research fellow um, with spinal muscular atrophy um, and kind of developing medications around that. You could get a trust grade job um, in a trust or a hospital working in paediatrics, quite a lot of places offer those in neonates because uh, you don't tend to get that much experience in neonates earlier on in your training. And finally, you can go and work or volunteer abroad. Um, lots of other trainees that I work with at the moment have worked in either New Zealand or Australia or have gone to work in various parts of Asia or kind of Africa with like medicines without front borders and things like that as well. So just a kind of um, little list of other specialties that involve children. I don't think I fully appreciate this at all until I started my paediatric training, but we work with all these specialties all the time. Um, surgery is probably the biggest one that I'm surprised about. So most surgical specialties will have some paediatric patients, particularly plastic surgery, ENT and orthopaedics. Um, there is also a subspecialty of paediatric surgery, which is own training through core surgical training. Um, pretty much every specialty other than um, kind of most of the medical specialties, you will have some involvement with children. And um, the exceptions to that are cardiology, where we get involved with our adult cardiologists and haematology, which cross covers paediatrics as well. So any of these placements that you're on, you can um, go to clinics or try and see children or get um, kind of introduce yourself to the consultants or registrars that work with children in that specialty. So just a few top tips for applying and kind of thinking about paediatrics. Basically just a well-rounded CV is fine. Um, you can kind of do any audits or projects. They don't need to be paediatric specific. Um, they seem to really like reflection and so to try and develop your skills in that. Relate your other experiences to the specialty. So kind of examples that I often use is taking a collateral history and um, kind of care of the elderly is quite relatable to paediatrics, very similar skills. If you've had a job in neurology, you've been able to do lumbar puncture. We do lots of lumbar punctures all the time. Or if you've worked or had a placement in a surgical specialty, so like ENT or something like that, and you've been seeing children as part of that. And finally, make sure you join the RCPCH and keep an eye out on their website and the UK Aspiring Paediatric Society. OK, so just the final section of the talk, so a bit about the training pathway. Um, just as a kind of caveat before I start talking, there is um, the paediatric training is undergoing a transition at the moment. Um, so it probably is going to change over the next couple of years. The estimated date of it starting to change is just next year, 2023. Um, but they're not, it's not 100% clear how that transition is going to happen. Um, so I've got the current training pathway, which is what's running at the moment, and then the future training pathway. But you'll see that there's not actually that much of a difference. So this is the current training pathway um, and it's eight years, as I mentioned earlier, and it's completely run through. You don't need to reapply at any point. It's currently split into three levels. Um, so there's kind of the starting level, which is year one to year three. And that's when you're expected to do your examinations. Um, in that, you need to have spent six months in general paediatrics and six months in neonates. There's then the level two, which is year three and year, year four and year five, sorry. And again, you do neonates in that block general paediatrics and some community paediatrics as well. Um, and then you can decide to, that you want to be a general paediatrician or that you want to subspecialise and you do that in level three, which is year six, year seven and year eight. So it's essentially core training and then specialty training. 
the training program that's going to be coming in around 2023 and I think they're going to kind of transition everyone across to is going to be slightly shorter so it's going to be seven years and it'll be split in two and the idea behind this is that it's a bit more general um, but also that um, there's a bit more support around you transitioning from being a kind of SHO or senior house officer to being a registrar um, and they want to provide a bit more support and there's also going to be a bit more time to do those exams. So having mentioned exams, just a little run through of what, what the examinations are. Um, so while in your sort of first part of your training, there's three written exams um, and they kind of um, they're kind of logical in the way they work. So the first one is about like diagnosing medical problems. The next one's kind of like the pharmacology and the physiology of the conditions. And the final one is thinking about what investigations you might do and what management you might want to um, kind of put in place. Um, and then after you've done your written exams, there is one clinical exam, which is like a big OSCE, um, where you see lots of different children and kind of do communication stations and examinations and things like that. Once you pass those, that's actually all your exams done. And um, there's no exit exam apart from this start exam, um, which is kind of like a um, multiple mini interview um, for the trainees just before in the year before they become a consultant. It's not really an exam, of course, it's kind of more um, a sit down to see um, how ready you are to become a consultant and if there's any areas in your portfolio that you need to work on before you start applying for consultant jobs. So I just um, wanted to show this slide because I think uh, people aren't really aware of um, the procedures and the wide range of procedures that we do in paediatrics. Um, so on the left of the screen, under mandatory, those are all the procedures that I need to be able to do um, within my first few years of training. Um, we're probably one of the only other specialties apart from like anaesthetics and A&E that are required to be able to intubate um, and we need to intubate um, newborn infants. And we also put in what are called like essentially cybercentral line through the umbilical cord. And those are essential um, procedures for our training. On the right, there's kind of just a small summary of the other um, kind of non-compulsory but possible procedures that you can be involved with. Um, and particularly common and interesting ones are um, kind of putting in needles, so interosseous needles, which are into the bone. Um, doing chest drains, which you do quite often on um, neonates, um, and the suprapubic aspiration of urine, which I mentioned, which is where you can get a urinary sample from just below the belly button. Anna? Uh -huh. Sorry, um, I think the, um, the audience are having a bit of trouble seeing your slides moving along. Oh, right, okay. We're on the slide at the moment saying gaining experience as a medical student. Oh, right, okay. Sorry about that. I didn't no, realise that people were having trouble. It's okay. I'll just finish it. There we go. Sorry about that. It's all right. Um, sorry, I'll just try and reshare my screen. So that's the gaining experience as a medical student slide. Um, is that moving along to the next slide? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. It's now on gaining experience as a doctor. Is that, are those slides moving along? Yeah, so that's showing other specialties involving children. Okay, do you want me to just quickly recap those slides that we've missed or? Um, I, I think everyone could still hear, so maybe just just, yep. just pick up where you where you left off, if that's all right. Unless any yeah, that's no problem. Need Anna to go through anything, just pop it in the chat. Yeah, we can go through it. That's no yeah. problem. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, so that's just the list there of the competencies that we were talking about. I'm sorry that that didn't move along very well. Um, so there's just a kind of exhaustive list um, on the right there, but I did just kind of cherry pick a few of the more interesting ones from the portfolio. 
Um, and then just final slides um, here. So one thing that run through training kind of scares people, I think, because it's like a, a longish commitment, so seven to eight years. Um, but one thing to say about paediatric training is it is quite flexible. Um, so there's a few out of program options that you can do and you can do these for, for from ranging from six months to up to three years. Um, and the Royal College divides them into these categories. Um, so the first one is a career break. So that's just a little bit of time out of training to do some traveling or potentially have a family or something like that. Um, the next one is experience, which is a bit of time out um, where you can gain experience um, that's kind of outside of working in the NHS. So for example, going to volunteer, um, one of my colleagues went to work in Tanzania for a year, um, or you can go and work, um, one of my consultants goes and works in the Philippines with the CLEF palette service there um, and they really encourage that and they actually have pre-set up programs to enable you to do that um, and the way they defined it is being able to help support the health needs of other countries there are some um, out programs for extra training so for example if you work in a region that doesn't have a special interest in a certain area you might want to go and work in another region for a short period just to see and gain a bit more experience so colleagues um, last year he worked in Scotland um, and he moved to our region just for six months to work with children with cystic fibrosis. Um, it might be that you uh, want to step out of training for a year and do a kind of um, out of programme post in something completely different and um, sort of working in health technology or something like that. Or you can do research. So a lot of people choose to do a year in a master's or they might do a three year PhD and you can do that alongside your training um, or take a period to have time out to do that. OK, so I'm sorry about my slides not moving along and um, that's my last slide. So I'm just going to leave that up for now because um, I think that's the QR code and um, the feedback um, at the end. Um, and I'll pass over to Frankie to kind of share some questions there. Thanks so much for that, Anna. That was a really, really good overview of PEDS, I think. And I definitely learned some things that I, I didn't know about PEDS before. Um, we we only have one question from the audience at the moment, and it was about the OOPEs. Mm -hmm. um, someone just asked what your personal opinion is of them, and may, maybe you could just tell the audience a little bit more about, about those programmes. Um, so the out of program, the out of program. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I haven't um, done one myself, um, but I have had several colleagues that have done them. I think the most common one is research. So a lot of people have some time out to do kind of a master's degree or um, a PhD, and that's quite common, particularly if people have chosen to subspecialize or work in like a relatively academic hospital. The one that's kind of interesting to me, I think, is the kind of experience one, which is where you get to go and work in um, other countries. Um, and the RCPCH website's got a really good page about those and what those are available. Um, so one of my uh, registrars at the moment, who's a paediatric cardiology trainee now, he went and worked in Tanzania, I think for 12 months actually, and worked in a kind of neonatal unit there, um, where, which was like um, kind of quite rural. Um, and he was still kind of helping with babies who'd been delivered prematurely um, and then running like vaccination clinics and things like that. Um, it is relatively flexible in terms of taking a bit of a career break and, and to do some training or have family. Um, but you do just need to apply through your local deanery and kind of explain why you want to do that. Um, but they're usually relatively supportive. And then it's quite common for people to go and do like a fellowship um, in a certain specific topic um, around the region, just because paediatrics is a small specialty. So you can't get all the experience you might want um, in that particular um, region, for example. Um, so quite a lot of people might go to London or um, one of the other big cities to get more experience. Oh, OK, yeah, that's really interesting. I'd never actually heard of those programmes before. So you did you say there's information on that in on the RCPH website? Yeah, so the Royal College of um, Paediatrics and Child Health website has got like a full page on it. Um, and then the kind of topics from this slide I got from the Severn Deanery Paediatrics website, um, which is one of the uh, kind of deaneries near London. Um, and they've got a really nice breakdown of all the opportunities you can do. Oh, OK, fab. Yeah, no, that, that that sounds like a really good opportunity, especially if you've not had the chance, um, you know, so much earlier on in med school yeah. and early on in your F1 and F2 years. Mm -hmm. um, so 
you know just to the audience just carry on putting questions in if you want to ask Anna any I can just ask any but um I've got a couple of my own that will potentially help the audience get a bit more information and then we can pick up mm -hmm. if anyone yeah. else has any so um why did you sort of pick paediatrics what and what do you kind of enjoy most about the specialty would you say personally um so I, I think um from, from the start um I kind of um really I think it was that lecture that brought the baby into the to kind of um lecture hall that really made me want to do paediatrics initially um and on the back of that I arranged like a to do a project with him so um I went and spent a few weeks in my summer um doing like a research project and working in neonates um and that was kind of what made me interested in doing the specialty um, and wanting to learn more about it and um, for me I think the main thing is working with children I just really enjoy it and um, I think you can be having the worst day and then you'll see the most like smiley bubbly three-year-old who was really ill yesterday but today is loads better and that just really makes my job worthwhile mm -hmm. I really really enjoy um kind of the diagnostic aspects of it because we don't do that many investigations we don't do that many blood tests so if a child comes to A&E and &E, um, we don't just automatically get a chest x-ray and a blood test and um, we really think about any tests that we do and because of that you have to really rely on your like history skills and skills um, and really think about um kind of coming up with a differential diagnosis before you go ahead and um, order those investigations, um, which is something that I really like. And you also get to see um, them kind of at the start of their um, journey with that illness. So for example, even like type one diabetes or a metabolic condition, we're kind of right at the start diagnosing that um, and kind of working with those children from the start, um, which is something I think you maybe don't get as much in other areas. Um, and I think finally, um, I just kind of I do quite enjoy doing procedures anyway, um, and that was something that I wanted to do in my job. Um, and there is definitely a, a more challenging aspect of procedures in paediatrics um, in terms of making it fun and making it not scary. Um, and then actually being more technically probably slightly challenging as well, particularly in like the small babies. Yeah. OK, yeah, so quite a lot of things that you're enjoying about it at the moment then. <laughs> um, is there anything that you personally have found particularly challenging in your experience so far? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I think probably the challenging bits are, um, the main things are being involved in safeguarding can be really challenging, um, but it can also be really rewarding as well. So um, we do see some kind of difficult cases, um, but I do think um, kind of advocating for that child, recognising those concerns, um, and um, escalating them and being involved in that process is also really rewarding. Um, and also, I, I, like particularly on paediatric cardiology, unfortunately, um, some of our children don't make it and um, there is quite a high mortality, particularly in that subspecialty, and that can be quite challenging. Um, but because of that, I think people are very supportive and very aware of that. So um, a lot of my colleagues are really like close um, and kind of do a lot of stuff outside of work. They're always there for each other. And if we've heard that someone's had a bad shift, you'll always be texting and mess checking they're OK arranging to meet up for a coffee and um, so although there are those challenging aspects of it and um, I think there are the positives too and personally like I found other specialties quite emotionally challenging and children and paediatrics I find quite rewarding and um, because I feel that the kind of benefits of it outweigh those kind of emotional challenges and um, I guess it's a bit independent to you and how you feel about that yeah and you think there's quite a lot of support in the specialty mm -hmm. so that kind of yeah. balances the hard bits definitely okay. I think so, yeah. um and just you know as a medical student myself I know that mm -hmm. it's quite um you, it's a bit hard to know where to begin with all the sort of mm -hmm. portfolio things and how to build an application I just wondered for the medical students watching mm -hmm. when did you sort of start with your application sort of thinking about doing things towards your application and what sort of things did you do you know early on to get mm -hmm. going to be honest I don't think I actively was like thinking about doing stuff in my application but because I was interested I kind of just naturally ended up kind of doing stuff that um, ended up later on being beneficial and um, so I think main things are as I say make the most of that paediatric placement that you have I think it's very easy because there's so many topics and so many new specialties and only so many new like diagnoses to learn about to get kind of like um drawn into the um kind of nitty-gritty kind of um reading the textbook rather than getting involved um, and I think just really throw yourself into 
into that clinical experience. Um, a lot of the consultants are really keen and want you to get involved, so it's worth asking them, can I come to your clinic? Is there anything that you're involved in? Um, and then any kind of, I got, I decided to do like a summer project, which was like a summer research project, which I mentioned um, in neonates, which was really, really worthwhile. Um, and then arranged kind of student selected components and electives in that specialty. Um, but if you, a lot of people come to paediatrics quite late, just because you don't experience it till that later on in medical school, and that's fine too. Um, but kind of trying to make the most of those experiences that you can is really useful. Um, the RCPCH website is really, really good and the student membership is really good and so is the UK Aspiring Paediatric Society and they've got lots of opportunities for you there. Okay, fab. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think also, like you are saying, I think the application sounds a bit more flexible than applications mm -hmm. for other specialties as well. Yeah. Um, I was also just going to say, um, do you mind just popping the page up with the QR code and then people can yeah. continually um, do the yeah, feedback? Right. We've got the link on there as well um, for the audience. We've got the feedback um, link. Um, mm -hmm. There was just two other questions from the audience. Um, yeah. So one of the audience members asked, how do you keep up to date with your medical knowledge at you know now you're in the paediatric specialty um, yeah so i think one of the um, things that is slightly different about paediatrics is we do have quite a lot of departmental teaching and um, so sort of every morning between half eight and nine or um, currently on my job eight and half eight and um, the trainees get teaching so that's really good um, and it kind of means that you have kind of training and teaching every day um, and i haven't experienced that in other specialties as much and um, so that's really worthwhile um, we also, when you're in training, you get regional teaching. So one, so mine's actually this Wednesday, one day a month. You all meet with all the other trainees at the same level and have a full day of teaching. Um, you can also take lots of study leave. So um, you can do courses if you want to, um, or potentially prepare for exams. And I think having exams at an early stage in your training means that you are kind of driven to learn a bit more and do your own kind of learning um, outside and inside of work. Um, but I think the clinical balance, and because it is quite supportive and the scene is quite um, approachable, it means that if you want to go to clinic as a trainee or um, shadow a safeguard in medical, for example, they're usually quite open to you doing that. So that's usually the main things that I do. Okay, so lots of opportunities then. Um, and we've just got another question asking, how do you manage difficult children? I can imagine it being quite different to adults. So I guess um, difficult, diff I, I guess do you, if they mean like um, if they're being like, um, I guess it's kind of different depending on what their age is. I think probably the most difficult age that I find to manage is like the kind of one to two year olds where um, you can't explain to them what's going on. So they're obviously really scared. And then you're coming at them with a needle and they're like, oh, I don't know, like, don't, don't come near me. Um, and that can be quite difficult. Um, but we have these amazing, the nurses are amazing. I have to say the paediatric nurses are incredible and they're really good at kind of helping you with those situations. Um, so you never do a procedure on your own. You always take a nurse with you. Um, and we do have special trainees, uh, special kind of healthcare professionals. So people like play specialists who are specially trained and often have degrees in essentially play therapy so um, and that's kind of um, making situations less stressful through play and most wards will have that um, we also have lots and lots of toys um, in the bloods room in my current place that I work we have a 3D television so they get 3D glasses and they can like watch this like it's like an under the sea scene and there's like a firefighting scene while you do the blood tests um, we use numbing cream as well. So once you put the numbing cream on and 3D glasses on, they don't even notice what you're doing most of the time. The other kind of side of that, I guess, is kind of the adolescent age group can be kind of challenge can be quite challenging, um, and getting the balance right of being kind of um, open and approachable, but also recognizing that you're in a position of authority can be quite difficult and getting that balance can be quite hard and um, but there's lots of resources and there's the kind of consultants who specialize in young people's medicine that are always approachable in those situations and um, so I guess that's kind of how we handle it I hope that's answered that question that's a really good question yeah I think I think it's true isn't it it is very different because I I mean like your slides here I think medical students are terrified of peds and yeah. my experience is that doing exams on them you just have to be so opportunistic and mm -hmm. you know 
get them while they're not crying and stuff. And it's, it is very difficult. It's very different. So I might, you know, I can imagine it must be quite challenging day to day. But like you say, if you're, you know, if you love working with kids, then that's you. Um, I'm just going to make sure we haven't got any more questions. Bear with me just one second. I've just got a few minutes left. I think that's all of the questions from us. And um, we haven't got anything else come through in the chat at the moment. Um, so people have got the feedback link. Um, thank you so much for that. That was really interesting. I'm sure everyone really enjoyed it. Um, and if you've got, you've put your email there. So if people do yeah, want to so ask you anything. Um, and I will can... just put the link for that video um, in as well. Um, or I can get you to email it around or something like that um, in as well. If yeah. it will let me on it. We will um, be. So it's probably quite easy to access, but it's just on YouTube. Um, and it's the Geordie Hospital kit um, on YouTube. Okay, sure. Um, do you want me to do you want me to post the link on the chat? Um, yeah, I can just I'll just find it to you. To really yeah, send it to me and I can pop it on. Or we, yeah, I actually, I you might be able to even pop it on. I don't know. Yeah. I think because um, I've implanted the video, the link's on there. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Um, just before we go, one one other question just came through asking mm -hmm. if um international medical students are able to join the societies that you mentioned, such as the UK APS. Yeah, so I think so. Um, I don't think there's any restriction. Um, the UK one maybe might be slightly restricted, but I don't think so. Um, RCPCH definitely isn't because um a lot of international kind of um like trainees pediatric trainees are members of the rcpch um and there's international conferences so i think their conference last year was like in singapore um so they often are um, kind of international as well so I, I don't believe there's any restrictions definitely not for rcpch and i don't think so for uk aps either okay cool um well, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, the, the webinar will be going up onto YouTube. So if anyone missed anything and wants to have a check, they can go on there and have a look when it's uploaded in, you know, about a week's, week or so's time. And then, um, yeah, you guys will all get your certificates if you fill in the feedback. Um, the link is just in the chat there. So um, thanks That's for everyone for attending as well. And thanks, Anna. So we'll, we'll sign off so now. Much. Thank you very much. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye.